Welcome to Bond University on iTunes U. I might make a few comments that flow directly from my namesake's observations here. Dobsiewski, famous Russian author, if I recall correctly, said that if you want to judge a society, judge it by looking at how it treats its prisoners. And I ask myself, what might pe people think of us in 20 or 50 years' time with respect to how we treat people under what is punitive detention? Call it what you will, it is punitive detention, particularly as that applies to those who are predicted to commit future sexual or violent crimes. With great authority by those who parade themselves as experts, yet we know unequivocally that no one can predict the future, no matter how we look at actuarial tests, structured professional judgment and the like, the probability of being correct in any one occasion never has been shown to exceed 50%. So we are merely coin tossers, no matter how we parade ourselves as experts. And I think if we look at the concept of deterrence and deterring someone's future behaviour, it is perhaps also relevant to consider that in Spitalfields, in the United Kingdom, where the last public hangings were conducted for pickpockets, it was routinely observed that pickpockets would be working the crowd, watching pickpockets being hung. What has changed, I ask myself, since the 19th century in that regard, with respect to specific and general deterrence, not much, I'm afraid. One of the questions I might pose then, with that quick preamble, for Professor Coyle is this. Given your vast experience in prisons, given your vast experience in looking at the failure of prison-based programs, for want of a better term, to change behaviour, what comments can you make about the concept of preventive detention for sexual and violent offenders that may, just perhaps may, assist us to do a better job? You want me to answer this? Yes. <laughs> That's why I asked the question. <laughs> Well, I wasn't going to give you an easy one. No, no. Um, I, I, I think the main comment which I would make to that is caution about the using the criminal justice system to deal with issues of civil justice and, more importantly, social justice. I think what has happened within our lifetime, if, if I may say so, uh, is that criminal justice um, has moved into areas where, quite frankly, it has no locus, it has no right to be. Um, I think um, criminal justice in any society has an important role to play in, in, in underpinning the values of a society. But criminal justice can never replace those values. And once you move into the, the sort of areas that Ian is asking me about, then we're taking criminal justice into an area which it should not be. Let me take, for example, the, the, the question of, of mental illness, which, which I have more operational um, experience of. What, what, what was obvious to me, I described Brixton Prison um, 20 years ago and the number of mentally ill people who were there. These, the people who were, the degree of mental illness which they had was such that they lived under the radar of society. They never came to the attention of any of our institutions in society. The only time, or the first time, that they popped up above the radar 
was when they were arrested for convicting, uh, for committing a criminal offence. And of course, the bit of the radar they popped up above was the criminal justice system. And so the criminal justice system is asked to deal with all these other issues, whether it's uh, health, whether it's housing, whether it's any other form of social support, are able to say, none of our business, mate. Let the prison superintendent deal with it. Let the prison uh, governor deal with it. Let the prison even uh, psychologist um, deal with it. The, the answer, I think, to, to your question is, is not to avoid the problem. There clearly is a problem, and I don't think in terms of, of, of the situation in Australia, it's for me um, to answer the detail of the specific problems you have, other than to say, this is not a criminal justice problem. I've been in this country now for almost a week, and I've read each morning in the newspaper um, about, um, about youngsters sniffing, um, uh, fuel, about uh, a wide variety of issues which manifest themselves in the criminal justice system but actually are nothing to do with the criminal justice system. And the point I think was made, um, it may have been by you yourself, Professor Coyle, um, uh, earlier um, about uh, the fact that at, at root these are problems of, of health or of other uh, social, social welfare. And really, we should not be dealing, the issue of, of the, the, the video which we saw earlier is not an issue for the prison in Alice Springs. It's, it's the ability of the, the, of, of, of the authorities to use the prison which is there um, uh, as, as a solution. Alexander Patterson, whom I quoted a couple of times before, talked about the prison being, his phrase was, an omnium gatherum, which, which is not really a Latin word, but it, it, sounds, it sounds very impressive. What it means is, it's a place into which you gather everyone, an omnium gatherum. When you don't know what to do with someone, you send that person to prison. And this, he was writing in 19, 1920, almost 100 years ago, and he said, whenever we build prisons, society will use them. That was a comment that he made over 100 years ago, and that is nowhere more obvious to me as an outsider than it is in Alice Springs today. The, the prison is there, so the prison is being used. I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but it went on for a long time. <laughs> I think your reference to the blunt force of the criminal justice system is right on the money in that regard, quite frankly. Um, Astrid. Oh, okay. um, I just want to do a bit of conceptual rearranging and then I'll ask you to comment on. Um, so I've been in the public service for 25 years but I've never been a bureaucrat. So my task has really been to be an entrapper of bureaucrats. So in order to do that I need to have rules of thumb, drip drip method. Um, when they realise there's some radical strategy about to commence and they're screaming how did we get here, I show them the 10 memos that they've signed. Um, so that's kind of the strategic way I've operated. What I found useful is a model that Slobogan and Fondacaro, I hope that's how you pronounce his name, just because you know you only ever see it in writing. Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> and this is to do with mental health and deprivation of liberty, but I've always found these three points useful. It's around punishment, prevention and protection. So punishment, we know there's 25,000 studies that say punishment doesn't change behaviour, so we ditch that concept. Prevention's around deterrence, incapacitation, risk management. Um, so we know that there's not a lot of social science evidence for it, but pragmatically it's what politicians want. So we're kind of stuck with it at the moment. And protection is about um, supporting autonomy uh, within offenders is how I apply it. So we talked about punishment, deterrence, reform and community protection as four separate issues. The way I like to rejig it is to say community protection is the primary aspect sitting at the top and we're all interested in community protection whether we work with victims or offenders and within that if we're using a human rights model that we treat offenders as both rights holders and rights violators so we accept the fact that they violated the rights of others and that's something that we respond to but it doesn't mean that they're not rights holders so as correctional staff we're duty bearers and we need to meet the rights of people even if they're offenders so when I take that model and apply it to the prison 
um, that I set up. So I was applying a model that's been developed with <coughs> Professor Tony Ward and we looked at legal, social and moral rights. So legal rights are rights in domestic and international law and most lawyers I th come to the conclusion the human rights sector is hijacked by lawyers. And so, sorry, that's an anti-interdisciplinary comment, but it's a little bit frustrating. So everyone looks at the law and legal rules. I know that prison officers on the ground don't really care about that. So the next step is social rights, and what are the rights that an institution needs to provide to an offender? So I was lucky enough that I stepped into an empty prison. So I got to create the culture, but it took me two years for prison officers to realise that they weren't going to shout and swear at prisoners that they could take the graffiti off the back of the door, that we uh, draw a line in the sand here and the sea washes it away, or we only hit people with a feather, and that they weren't going to have me running kangaroo courts. Um, but the core business, I think, are the moral rights. And what Tony Ward and I have said is that there's two core values, and that's freedom and well-being. So a person may lose their freedom from imprisonment, but it needs to be rationally justified. So preventive detention, to me, is not rational. But the other aspect is well-being. And so in my mind, nobody should leave a correctional system worse off in their physical, social and psychological well-being. They should at least be the same as they came in and even better if they left the system in a better condition. So I guess what I'm asking is if community protection is put as the primary goal and then the balancing act that's pragmatic. So I'm not talking about abolition of prisons because as a practitioner I'm stuck with the systems I work in and that's my method of sort of getting around all the issues around imprisonment. Um, I, I, I think one presents and adapts models um, as best suits the circumstances um, which we are in. So you're absolutely right. You, I could have presented my model in a different way. Mm -hmm. the, the, there is no... I, 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 I don't take any issue with you on that. And I think the work, the work which you um, and, and, and Tony Ward has done, uh, have done has been tremendously helpful um, in setting out those parameters um, that you have just described. I think what I was trying to do was, was almost, I mean, in, in, in preparing this presentation, I, I thought, now, what is it Patrick wants me to, to talk about here? how best to present this issue. One option um, would indeed have been to talk about what happens inside the prison. Um, I, I thought that actually wasn't what he was asking me to do. The danger, you, you and I have both spent many years working inside prisons. Um, you described yourself as an entrapper of bureaucrats my version of that is, is, is and I, I hope it's, it's not, I hope it's not unfair on myself, that for many years I, I used to think that I could only continue to work in the prison setting because I was really quite uncomfortable about, about doing so. I thought if the time ever came where I felt comfortable in running prisons, then it would be time to get out. Now, um, th that's perhaps a bit naive and a bit, bit self-serving, but, but I hope not entirely, because I think the, I, I ended up my presentation by talking, talking about an oxymoron, and I, I think talking about a good prison is, is an oxymoron. There is no such thing as a good prison. Uh, I, I am not, having spent 25 years working in them, a prison abolitionist. I, I would like to think that at some distant day in the future, we will find a better way uh, of dealing with these problems, that we will not have prisons. But for the foreseeable future, there will have to be prisons. But I think we need a very narrow definition uh, of, of, of what a prison is and the way that prison protects society. And much of the work um, that I've done and that you do, Astrid, would be much better done in the community rather than behind the high walls um, of, of, of a prison. There's a, um, a body of thought which you will no doubt be well aware of, um, which is um, achieving some notoriety today called justice reinvestment. Justice reinvestment is basically standing right back and saying, this is how much we spend on criminal justice. This is how much we spend on prisons. This is how much we spend on depriving people of their liberty. 
Is that improving the security and safety of communities and of societies? Or might there be another way to spend this money which would make communities safer? For the short period, you and I have to continue doing what we're doing and making prison, prisons as decent as they can and encouraging prison staff to be as, as, as professional uh, and respectful as they should be. But in the longer term, we must also, I think, uh, encourage the debate which challenges the way that we use prison um, per se and whether it actually does, um, because you're absolutely right to say what society is interested in first and foremost is safety, not only being safe, but feeling safe. And there's a big question mark as to whether, for example, the people in Alice Springs f feel much safer because they've got this high security prison 20 kilometers um, out, of the, out of the town. And just one last thought occurs to me as, as I answer that, which is we actually do need a discussion about physically what we mean by a prison. There's a famous, frequently said in London, uh, you mentioned Spitalfields, Ian, that if, if Charles Dickens walked back into Pentonville prison today, he would recognize it immediately. It hasn't changed. It still is the same. And the prisons which we build today, we build them with new materials and much higher security than they used to be, but basically they're the same buildings which we were building 100 years ago, and we ask, ask staff to operate within them uh, the same way as we have done for the, um, the last 100 years. So for the period, probably quite a long period, that we're still going to have prisons, I think we actually need a debate about wh wh what, sh what should that prison look like in order to give greater safety and security to the communities uh, which they serve. Well, then I must, must make a quick comment on that. I know Patrick's wanting to rise up. Um, for those of you who have seen Yes Minister, you'll recall perhaps a conversation between James Hacker, the ministers, and his secretary, Bernard Woolley, where James Hacker asked the question, what do the initials CMG after someone's name stand for? <laughs> they are, of course, stand for Call Me God. If it's KCMG, it's kindly call me God, and if it's GCMG, it's God calls me God. <laughs> <I've got a bit coughs> Professor Coyle, is, uh, CMG is an order of St Michael and St George. It's a very high distinction. And the Latin motto for that order is Auspicium Mariolus Aevi. It means, roughly translated, a token of a better age. And I suspect that that is a fair description for the thrust of what Professor Coyle has been putting forward. How can we make things better? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that, Ian. Uh, we've got some time now to take some uh, questions uh, for our uh, eminent speaker and our uh, panellists. Um, we've planned to have uh, morning tea at 11, so we've got uh, 20 minutes for exchanges, which is great. Um, I know you can see a bunch of hands shooting up already. Uh, so I'll ch be, be mindful of uh, the fact that many people want to ask questions. If I can ask you to be uh, crisp, uh, that would be good. We'll start with uh, Chris Lebogan. Okay, I was very interested in the comments from Ian and Andrew about criminalization. How do we decide what is a crime? What should we criminalize? And of course, a lot of crimes we have in the books today uh, could be termed uh, as crimes that involve a prediction of some sort. Range of conspiracy and attempt to predict mm. the conspiracy will take place. We predict the attempt will come to completion. Mm. Driving while intoxicated, we predict some kind of harm will come out of that. Mm. Drug possession, apparently we're predicting some kind of harm will come out of that. Mm. The vagrancy statutes, uh, apparently we're saying that someone loiters, they could eventually <laughs> cause some kind of harm. So I'm wondering, is a dividing point when a crime is based on a prediction? And do we declare those to be that situation which should not be crime, we'd rather handle some other way. Or is there some other principled way of resolving that issue? Because I think you're raising a very important point mm. that intersects with preventive detention in an interesting mm. way, and um, it's very hard to resolve, and also we should resolve it, of course, for legislation. Um, <coughs> dealing with the issue of prediction, 
that's essentially what we're dealing with sexual and violent uh, offenders. We're predicting what they might do, based in part on what they have done. But our predictions, it is quite clear, can never, well, there's nothing that works thus far that gets us over the bar of 50%. So we're essentially coin tossers. Now, it seems to me that to be making uh, a prediction on that basis and then de facto saying on the basis of that prediction that that person is a criminal, because that's what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Call it what you will, we're locking them up, even if they're in a de-gazetted part of the jail, which is the famous bureaucratic approach adopted in Victoria, at Ararat Jail, they simply excise part of the jail grounds from the jail by a stroke of the pen, de-gazetted it, but they're still in the same jail. They're criminals. We just don't want to call them criminals because they might do something. I, for one, can't stand it. And it is dressed up in terms of someone being a high-risk offender. Well, they're only high-risk relative to their own group. And they never get over it. We can never be certain we're over 50%. So, for myself, I don't think we should have preventative detention. I don't think it can be justified, except in the rarest of rare cases. And I don't think it should, in effect, be a criminal punishment that continues. In Queensland, uh, you might not have come up with this. In California, they had the three strike rule when you go back to jail. Well, going for gold, Queensland's beaten California. We now have the two strike child sexual offender act. You come out and you reoffend one of a series of defined offences, which may be, for example, indecent dealing over, sustained over a period of two or three occasions, I think three occasions. You go back in for 25 years, mandatory sentence. I agree with that. Um, the, the, the answer directly, Chris, I think, takes me back to what I said about criminal justice going into areas where it has no locus. Um, it seems to me uh, that um, the criminal justice system is always, um, this part of the criminal justice system, particularly the courts, um, uh, are to do with looking backwards. They're not to do with looking forwards, because once they start looking forward, uh, th 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 there are, of course, in all our society, we have to have people who look forward, who will, who will protect us um, for the future, uh, whether it's from uh, a national threat or an individual threat. But that's not the criminal justice system. Um, so uh, that, that's uh, another way of agreeing with what Ian has just said about, about preventive detention. If, if there is to be, uh, in exceptional circumstances, the use either of, of, of preventive detention or a way of limiting the risk that someone uh, will damage other people, then that I think uh, is not, it may be a judicial function, but I think it's certainly not the criminal, criminal uh, function and needs to be separated in terms of the delivery um, from, the, um, from, from, from the prison and the criminal justice system. We, the, the debate which we're having today, if I may say with respect, I, susp I, I, I don't know who, who this audience is, but I wonder if we've got the right people in the audience. Because we actually don't, it's not, this debate is not for criminal justice experts. This debate is for mental health experts and other people who really don't want to pick up this issue which they've got in the tray that says too difficult. Uh, that's a criminal um, justice matter. And I think what we need to do is take the debate out there to all these other um, uh, experts in, in other fields and say, this is not a criminal. The, the, the result when things go wrong becomes criminal justice, but the prevention is not certainly solely within the criminal justice arena. I think uh, Professor Petrilla had a question before. You got your hand up just a smidgen before or I after Judge Chris. You. Sorry? I had a question, Andrew, for you, and, and it's to draw a comparison to what happened with psychiatric hospitals to prisons and then see if mm -hmm. it has any implications for how we mm -hmm. might design a prison. So with mental health care, it started, as you know, in England with the notion of moral hygiene, mm -hmm. that you put people with mental illnesses in mm -hmm. country settings, that you kept them safe, you kept them, mm -hmm. gave them uh, farming, et cetera, et cetera. And 
the idea was that by some combination of environment mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. safe care that people would, uh, if not get better, at least mm -hmm. live healthier lives. Mm -hmm. Those hospitals got grossly overcrowded. There was one in uh, Long Island, New York, Pilgrim State Hospital, which eventually had 19,000 patients, which is hard to do pastoral care for. Um, and certainly with prisons, we've seen to some degree the same phenomenon that, at least in the United States, that the sheer numbers of people in prison uh, combined with what you've described as the physical environment of many prisons. So in mental health, we broke up those large hospitals, created smaller care units, et cetera, et cetera. In terms of where you think prison should go, and you said you would stipulate that they will be in existence at least for the foreseeable future, is it a design and numbers of people issue at bottom, or is it more than that? So how much does design and population affect what might reasonably then occur in prison, or is it simply beyond design and numbers? Is it just the, the concept of prison that is fundamentally um, damaging in mm -hmm. a sense? No, no it, it's both. Um, and and, and, and the, the, the parallel you draw is um, an interesting one and relates back to my comment about Dickens going into Pentonville because the, the large institutions, um, and there were many of them, uh, were a product of the Victorian era uh, in, in, in many countries, pushed by Ang Anglo Anglophone countries, one has to say, were, were, were uh, um, at the forefront. But there was, there was a great belief in the 19th century of the power of the institution, whether it was the penitentiary, and the name penitentiary speaks for itself, whether it was the reformatory, whether it was the, the psychiatric, whether it was the maudlin home for fallen women, um, whether it was the, um, the, um, the, the juvenile reformatories for young people. And in, in what has happened, one of the things I, I was the first professor of prison studies in King's College in London, uh, and uh, as well as being a matter of pride for me, it, it seemed to be very important that we had a debate about prisons and what prisons are, because the, the world of medicine in general and psychiatry in particular, as you told us last night, John, has developed beyond recognition over the last hundred years. But the world of the prison hasn't. It's, it's actually, it's, it's still largely um, as it was. I would like to think, so, so we do need a change similar to that which we have seen in the treatment of people with mental illness. Given that we're, the prison is, is starting 100 years or 50 years, let us say, um, after the world of, of mental illness, it may be that we can learn from the mistakes which were made <laughs> Uh, in quite a number of, of jurisdictions where it was thought to be sufficient simply to close the large institutions and then care in the community would somehow happen miraculously uh, without actually the community caring very much. Uh, and the same issue will come, I think, if we talk about reinvesting the, the cost of, of the, the prison as institution. We actually have to reinvest um, that, um, th those, those resources in community provisions, but not in criminal justice provisions in the community. Um, once we've done that, then we end up, just as you, I guess, as happened with psychiatric hospitals, that once you begin to deal, once you've solved the problem of quantity, and that, that, that's one of the big problems of running a prison system is, is the quantity, how many people there are, uh, how many people there are in the whole system, or how many people there are in individual prisons. Once you've dealt with the quantity problem, then you can start to discuss the quality problem. What sort of buildings do you need? Do you always need a high security prison in Alice Springs or, or wherever? Or do you need a different kind of detention or, or deprivation um, of liberty? And one can look to um, a number of jurisdictions. Uh, the obvious um, ones that we look at in the West are to countries like uh, Norway and, and Denmark, um, where the prisons are very small prisons, 
They are close to their communities. They're not on the outskirts. They're actually close to the communities. And one of the main function of the prison staff um, is not to create parallel structures, but to make sure that the people who are in prison have access to the resources which exist in the community and which they will continue to access once they're, once, once they're released. So uh, uh, the, 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 we, the prison world has a lot to learn from the world of psychiatry, including um, learning from the mistakes which were, were, were made. And, and, and once it, it reduces the, the throughput uh, of, of the system, it can begin to address what actually happens inside the prison uh, and actually make them more positive institutions um, than, they, than they are at the moment. I just make a comment. Yes, um, yes, the yes, prison yes. I ran has its own act, and it's the only act of its kind in Australia. So the judge oversees the entire sentence from go to woe, judicial um, due process protection. But also, um, after eight months, you could move next door, start accessing the community. And if you're doing OK, within 12 months, you could actually be living in the community, even if you had a three-year sentence on the bottom. So it's the only prisoners that actually get out before their sentence. But what it was was 60 per cent are two steps forward, one step Back. So they go out to community custody, ring us up, say I've stuffed up, I've gone out nightclubbing, taken ecstasy. So we'd say bring yourself back to the prison. We'd hold them for a period, review their treatment plan with the psychiatrist, the GP, the therapist, and then send them back out. And I think that's a really good model, um, but it's not been picked up by any other state where we were actually accessing community services to provide the rehabilitation. Um, I'm Dr. Singh from Sydney, Australia, a psychiatrist for 33 years. Now, the, the closure of uh, asylums does not mean that the problem ends there. We know now, surveys have shown in Australia and overseas, something like one in three or one in four prisoners have a mental illness. The fact that the institutions are closed, mm -hmm. and, and let me go a, a step back. We know that in mental illness, particularly in schizophrenia, about 25% of patients with schizophrenia are untreatable at present. They have severe treatment resistant schizophrenia. Clozapine in a number of them does not work. So there is at the moment with the best science, there is nothing you can do to reverse the cause of the illness, the delusions, the hallucinations. If they're let out, you're literally forcing them to then act on those beliefs and now become labeled as criminally insane. They then get the much needed treatment they never got before because the asylums are closed. They were sleeping under bridges. And now more and more forensic hospitals are opening up in New South Wales. There's a new forensic hospital opened up. There's one opened up in Bloomfield uh, in, in Orange. So, so the problem is it's just shifting from one to the other. So as far as the mental legal goal, I mean, we don't need that high level uh, detention centers. We need hospitals which are humane, the progress rehabilitation. Currently, for example, I work at Cumberland Hospital. We've got a very good rehabilitation facility. They get human treatment. Uh, some have to be kept there for long because you can't actually treat the illness. So I think it's a very difficult problem mm -hmm. as far as you know, what do we do with them. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the question of home detention, I think, is, comes up. That can we use electronic surveillance uh, for a certain number of people where you can detain them within the suburb, uh, you can detain them within a particular jurisdiction. And I think some, some forensic pre uh, patients in the UK, I think they're adopting the system. So the question is, is there a way forward for more of, you know, sort of uh, that kind of detention with surveillance and restricted to a particular suburb or region? Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you make some very important points. The, you're absolutely right about, let's remember what the world word asylum means. Asylum is a place of safety. Uh, and that's sadly what is so lacking um, for so many of the people um, whom you describe. They, they do need um, a place of, of, of safety. And it, it's not sufficient simply to say we close down the large psychiatric institutions and, and then the problem somehow will be resolved um, in the community. I, I think what is important is, I, I think we do need the, the sort of small units which you are describing. 
I think it's very important that they should be under the control of the health authority, whatever the health authority is, not of the justice or security ministry. Um, we should have moved away. Before we had the big, certainly in the UK, before we had the, um, the psychiatric hospitals under the authority of the, uh, of the health service, we had criminal lunatic departments. And the criminal lunatic departments were under the prison system. And thankfully we moved away from that, but having closed down the big psychiatric units de facto, we've created these criminal, what are in effect criminal lunatic departments in the prison system. We do need some um, facilities, but they should be under the, the health authority, not under the, the, the prison authority. Um, absolutely, we should be looking at um, um, more modern ways of, of um, supervising and supporting individuals. Uh, I think we, we already know enough to say that electronic monitoring can have some role to play, but it's a, it is also a very limited role because electronic monitoring <coughs> will only work if it includes a human element. It's simply not enough. Um, to hand over the electronic monitoring to, to a private security company who will then simply phone up the police and say he's broken his curfew, he's moved to somewhere he shouldn't be. If, if it's tied closely with community supervision, then I think all of these developments um, certainly have a, have a place to play, without doubt. Ian, no. Astrid, did you want to make a comment? Uh, just um, deterrence, it drives me nuts because um, deterrence doesn't work unless you've got the person engaged and you need the human interaction, like we said. So in my election, we've done now 30,000 urine tests. We're awash with it at the prison. Um, so we had to test people three times a week. So I thought, okay, I'm stuck with bad legislation. What do I do? Um, so I said, okay, I will reward you if you provide a drug treat free result. So. I had, I've had to flip the purpose of the testing to prove they were drug free so they could get an additional reward because I didn't take any of the privileges off them. They had all their privileges and on top of that I would add extra rewards. So we never locked anyone up in their cell or took a TV off them and all that business that generally goes on in prisons. For more information, visit bond.edu.au forward slash iTunes U.